Rhetorical Quest. Hello, movie fans. Since we're more than halfway through looking at uh, looking at this rhetorical quest and looking at rhetoric, if you saw the other side of my office, so that's what's going on there. But anyway, this uh, this video, we're going to start talking about the canon of style. And when we talk about the canon of style, we're talking about the actual words that we choose to use in a conversation or in a presentation like I'm giving now or like you'd be giving when that's going on. Style is the same as saying verbal communication. Remember when we said delivery was nonverbal? Well, style is verbal. Style is the words that you use. So it's the same thing as language and it can be written uh, it can be signed, it can be, if you speak sign language, uh, it can be oral. In fact, most of the time what we think of is oral when we think of style. We think of the words that come out of our mouth. Uh, but really, it can, be, it can be any of those. So it's not just limited to, uh, to the words that come out of our mouths. Uh, and it's really, really important it's important that we think about the words that we're going to use, and here's why. Uh, in my discipline, in the study of communication, there's something we talk about every now and then called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. And the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, oh, that sounds like something from Star Trek. Uh, oh my goodness, Captain, what should we do? The, the, the lithium crystals will crack according to the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. No, the, the lithium crystals won't crack according to the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. The Sapir-Whorf hypothesis is basically the idea that when we use different words for something, we develop different thoughts for it. Okay? So the words that we choose and the words that we put things together with, these are different thoughts that, that will go into it. Uh, so this makes it really, really important that we understand something about the words that we use. And there's a few things that I want to cover fairly quickly. I'm going to run through them in this video. Uh, and I want to talk about euphemisms, I want to talk about vulgarity, that should be fun, I want to talk about jargon, I want to talk about slang, I want to talk about argot, and I want to talk about all of these because they're words that will affect us and the way we, they affect the way we think about our reality. So I want to talk about, about each of these. First of all, let's talk about euphemisms. Euphemisms are a way that our worldview is created through the use of language uh, and in this through euphemisms uh, we talk about and think about things that we would prefer not to have to talk about and think about but because we choose a euphemism rather than doing it than speaking about it directly uh, we can kind of talk around the subject and sometimes it makes us feel a little bit more comfortable talking about it some examples might be maybe you've heard somebody say that they slept together well, really what they meant by that is they had sexual intercourse. But they say they slept together. One of them that we use all the time is, I've got to go to the bathroom where there's no bathtub. Or I need to use the restroom. Are you tired? No, we use these words because we don't want to talk about the fact that we're urinating or defecating. Uh, we, we, we'll use in the military the term collateral damage. Collateral damage is when they kill civilians, people who weren't in the fight. Sometimes you'll hear somebody say that they're between jobs. Well, that between and blue implies there's another job on the end of it that may or may not be there. Sometimes in certain companies that I've worked for, they've talked about how there was inventory shrinkage. Like, the inventory just shrinks. No, employees were stealing it. They were talking about employee theft, but they didn't want to accuse anybody of theft. That would have been rude, so they say, call it shrinkage. Have you ever heard of a place uh, called a gentleman's club? Let me tell you, that's not a place guys go to learn good manners. It's a place where women strip off their clothes for money. Sometimes we'll say we're gathering intelligence. And then once we've got it all gathered up, there should be stuff. No, we're gathering intelligence. 
It means to spy. Here's the deal with euphemism. As a public speaker, you have the ability to form your listeners' thoughts patterns around a subject. And there's some things you need to think about when you decide you need to use a euphemism in your speech, when you're deciding whether or not to. Will the euphemism be understood? Will it be something that people actually know the meaning that you're trying to get at? And will and the euphemism will soften your speech. Do you want to? You might feel like you need to do it to make it more palatable, in which case go ahead and use the euphemism. In other cases, you might feel like if you use the euphemism, your speech is just not going to be strong enough for your audience. You need to think about it. Another decision that you'll have to make is whether or not you want to use vulgarity in your speech. In a lot of ways, vulgarity is kind of the opposite of a euphemism. It's a way of creating a worldview using our language by using a metaphor that is more shocking and more extreme than the actual thing about which you're talking. What are some examples of, of vulgarity? Well, remember how when we were not having the nice euphemism, we said that people slept together to have sex? Well, a vulgar way of saying that would be saying they screw. You see that? It's just a little bit too strong. Remember how we used to say, we said in the, in the euphemism that you would go to the bathroom? Well, to urinate, to defecate, whatever. Uh, that's fine. Well, a vulgar way of saying is, I'm going to go take a dump. There are a lot of examples where you choose to, could choose to be vulgar. And it might be a choice that you make. As a public speaker, you have the ability to affect your audience's worldview. In general, I feel like vulgarity should be avoided. Uh, but I'm you know, not the only person who's thinking about this, writing about this, and making videos about this. During the 1960s and 1970s, uh, a lot of radical speakers felt like they needed to say vulgar things in vulgar ways. And they felt like if they weren't saying it in a vulgar way, that it wasn't strong enough for their audience. It may have worked. Another thing that may have happened is we may have become desensitized to their vulgarity. Or maybe even worse, we started to accept the vulgar language and actually started to see things as being that way. See, vulgarity affects your mind, just like any of the other things that we're going to talk about today. And so when you hear that, you start to think of these things in vulgar ways. And you start to see them as disgusting, or gross, or evil, or bad, and they're just something that goes on. You need to think about it. Do you really want to, to have your audience see things as disgusting and gross? Maybe you do, but maybe you don't. So you need to make a decision about whether or not you're going to use vulgarity. Another thing that we need to talk about and that we need to think about are things like jargon. Jargon is when words are used in technical fields which render complex concepts simply in order to save time. Now, we think about things differently because of the words that we use, and jargon allows us to see things that are very complex and difficult, very complex and difficult subjects, as being relatively simple. If you work at, uh, if you work in the nonprofit world, you've probably heard the term 501c3. And in fact, you might use that around your din dinner table. Well, the 501c3 is an organization, uh, refers to the tax code, and it's an organization that's run without a profit motive, and therefore is tax exempt. I've taught you, uh, read, read, I've taught you jargon in this rhetorical quest. We've talked about the canons of rhetoric, the theory of invention, the artistic and inartistic proofs. These are all jargon. I know that I grew up, my father's a pastor, and so, you know, I remember asking him, you know, well, why is it that this, this other church uh, here, why is it that these people are all gathering up so much food? And he says, oh, that's because of their eschatological beliefs. And I said, oh, 
because I knew what that meant. I was probably eight at the time. Why did I know what eschatological meant? Well, it's jargon that you learn if you hang around with preachers. And it means religiously derived opinions about what's going to happen at the end of the world. So all he needed to tell me was it was because of their eschatological beliefs, and I knew what it meant. It's jargon. It's not something that everybody just knows all the time. These are all examples of jargon, and you need to think about using jargon. I've heard people say in their, public in their recommendations for public speaking that jargon should be avoided. I don't think that's true. See, jargon really does allow us to think about complex things in simple ways. And so if you can give your audience the gift of a new word and a new term to talk about something complex in a relatively simple way, that can be a gift to your audience. But you shouldn't use jargon that you don't explain. It will give your audience the ability to see things and understand things in new ways. And that's great. But not if you don't explain it. If you don't explain it, they're never going to really understand it. Another thing to think about is slang. Slang is when words are used in a particular region or class that are not part of the standard vocabulary of the language. Now here's the thing, just like with everything else, we start to think about things differently if we start talking about them using slang. And slang is often used because the, the speaker is either ignorant about the proper use of language or doesn't care. And that's what we need to think about when we think about slang. Do we want our audience to think that we're ignorant or that we don't care? That might be the case. On the other hand, sometimes slang can be used when you're talking to a group and you are part of that group and they are part of that group and together you're talking about this. In those cases, slang can sometimes be used in order to create a bond. You can only do this if you have a, an audience with fairly narrow demographics. If you've got a large demographic, using slang is going to make it look like you're stupid. But in a small demographic, it can show that he or she is one of us. Another way that we use langu that, that language that affects us might be used in a speech is that sometimes people will decide to use an argot. An argot is a language used by an oppressed group, often criminals, to hide their meaning from their oppressors, often governments. And when you start to talk about things using an argot, you do start to think about them in, in particular ways. Now, I'm going to tell you I could talk about a few argot terms I might know, but when a fat professor like me actually learns some argot, it's not valid argot anymore. Uh, we could talk about a John as being a person who solicits prostitutes. Well, that's not really hiding it from the police anymore, but when that term was developed, it was just you could say he's a John. And if the police hears that, does that mean that he solicits prostitutes? That's not the first thing that would come to their mind. Uh, a person says their cousin Mary is coming over, meaning they're getting some marijuana. That could be the case. I know that uh, certain ha hackers will do hardware hacks, software hacks, and what they call wetware hacks. And wetware hacks is when they trick a human being into giving information that that human being shouldn't be giving out. But wetware, it just sounds like another thing going on, uh, doesn't sound quite as nefarious as it really is. Here's the thing about using an argon. If your audience understands you, you will be revealed as a criminal. And if they don't, your speech didn't work. So in general, I would say that you should probably avoid argot in your speeches. Okay, why should we try and avoid argot? Why should we explain our jargon? Why should we think about whether we want to use vulgarity or euphemisms. Why shouldn't we just get up and talk and say what comes to mind? 
Well, here's the reason, and I, I've told you this already. The words we use affect our worldview and the worldview of our audience. If you want your audience to think about things in the way that you want them to think about it, you choose the style and you choose the language that you want to use. I'm going to have another video dealing with style. And it's going to deal with something just a little bit different. This video, the next one, is going to deal with the concept of citation. So I hope you'll stay tuned because I'm excited to be thinking about citation and how it is that we can how we can give credit where credit's due but still develop ideas from other people's ideas.